Hello and welcome to our science showcase um, designed to celebrate British Science Week here at Hicksville Girls School. I'm joined with Mrs. Watley and Mrs. Watley is going to tell you all about the delights that await to um, celebrate that National Science Week. The most important thing in our science showcase is the work that our Year 7 and 8 girls have been doing at home during lockdown. They've been hard at work on their science fair projects and they had a choice of doing a research project or a practical project, so you'll get to see lots of those. Look out for your own if you've got your in Year 7 or 8 or you have a daughter in Year 7 or 8. And then we've done some experiments to try and infuse people with um, science. So myself and Mr. Atwood, well, we've kind of been playing with liquid nitrogen and we've had a lot of fun with that. Mr. Root has been doing what he does best, which is blowing stuff up. And then Mr. Fuller has, well, because biology is a bit slow, it takes a long time for things to grow, so he's prepared a few little practicals that you can have a go at at home during the remainder of the lockdown period. That's fun. That's fun, it really. Sounds very exciting and it reminds me when I was watching um, your lovely show with Mr. Atwood how much fun it can be to be a science teacher. Um, so it took, took me back fond memories of blowing things up. I've not done that in a while. Um, so I do hope that you enjoy all of that and remember the main focus is the celebration of the girls' work. I know that you've all been super busy during the lockdown period to bring something that's quite unique and insightful to our science week. So well done, everybody. If you've got a garden or you've got access to a local park and you're able to go there but despite the Covid restrictions this is one that you can do. It's about estimating the population of snails in that particular area and the way you do it is really really straightforward. Give yourselves either five or ten minutes and collect every single snail that you can find. Remember to be gentle with them because you're going to put them back once you've found them. Once you've found your snails, you should have a number of them available to you. You're going to need some clear nail varnish. Please don't use coloured nail varnish for this. You're going to take your snails, you're going to take a small amount of the clear nail varnish and you're going to put the nail varnish, a small square of it, right on the very top of their shell. You do not need very much. We're not covering the whole shell, we're just putting a little mark on their shell with the clear nail varnish. We're using clear nail varnish, not coloured, because then it won't um, attract any predators of the snails. If you use red or blue or green, it might make your snails more likely to be eaten by birds. Once the nail varnish is dried, you're going to go and you're going to put your snails back where you got them. You then need to wait for a day or two, because snails move very slowly. After a couple of days, you're going to go back out and you're in the same amount of time as you sampled the first time, you're going to see how many snails you can find. You're going to collect all your snails in and you're going to count them up. And you're going to have a look. How many snails that you found the second time round have the little nail varnish mark on them and are therefore the ones that you found the first time? And then there's a really quick little sum that you can do to work out the size of your snail population. The calculation you need to do to work out the population size of your snails is the number of snails you sampled the first time minus the number of snails you sampled the second time and then you need to divide that number by the number of snails that you found the second time round that had the nail varnish mark on them. Once you've done that, that should give you a really good estimate for the size of your snail population. Um, good evening and welcome. My name's Mrs Watley and I'm Head of Science here at Hayesfield and this is Mr Atwood, our Head of Physics and tonight we're going to be showing you some little tricks with liquid nitrogen. Very exciting. Very excited about this. Shall we start? So, here we have some liquid nitrogen. Now, liquid nitrogen is a colourless liquid, a bit like water, actually, except it is a completely different chemical. Uh, clues in the name, this is the element nitrogen. Now, we are used to 
nitrogen. Uh, in fact, the air that is all around you is 78% nitrogen. The big difference is though, the air around you is a gas. Now this nitrogen has been cooled down to minus 196 degrees C. This is very, very cold. And at that temperature, it turns into a liquid. And that's what we can see here. Now, one thing you will notice about our liquid nitrogen is you can see it bubbling away. It is currently boiling. Now we're used to boiling things at 100 degrees C, but because we're used to boiling water, but, the temperature of our bowl, about 20 degrees, room temperature, is more than enough to boil away our liquid nitrogen. And as we drop it onto the table, you can see it slowly, or actually very quickly, turning back into a gas. What do you think of that, Mrs. Watley? That's, that's pretty good. Um, so what do you think we should do with it tonight? It's, well, it's super, super cold. I don't want to get it on my skin, so we've got our correct safety precaution. We've got our visors, we've got our special gloves so that we don't harm ourselves. Um, shall we see what happens when it turns into a gas? Ooh, yes, why not? Why not indeed? So, what we have here is we have two small containers. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a small amount of our liquid nitrogen into these containers. Now the containers are pretty warm. Okay, they are room temperature. Let's get a little bit more. And then what we're going to do, very carefully, because it is very cold, is we're going to take a balloon and we are going to place our balloon on the top of our container. <laughs> Mine popped off too quickly. There we go. <laughs> now what you should have seen um, before they popped off is as the liquid changes into a gas, it expands and it fills up the balloon and eventually the gas pressure is so high that it causes the balloon to pop off our conical flasks. But there's another way we can show the effects of liquid nitrogen with balloons. Indeed there is. So here we now have a balloon filled with air. I believe this is Miss Jarvis's air. Thank you very much, Miss Jarvis, for donating this. And what we can do is we can cool this down. Now what you'll notice, very obviously, is our balloon starts to get smaller. Now that's not because the air is escaping, it's because the air is changing into a liquid. And it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Ooh. And then when we take it out, Miss Jarvis's breath starts to change back into a gas and it starts to expand. I'm going to put mine back in, I think. Give it a go. Now, one thing that you might not be able to see at home, but we can see here, is actually in the bottom of the balloon, Ooh, let's see if I can use these, there is a small puddle of liquid, well, air, just down here. Now this is nitrogen, this is a bit of oxygen, and there's even some white powder in there, which is, oh. Is yours popped? Mine's popped, which is the carbon dioxide uh, in the air as well. You're much better at this than me. I think it's the quality of your balloon that counts, <laughs> sir. Okay, so. Well, after all that, I'm feeling a little bit hungry. A bit hungry? A little um, bit hungry. Have you had any breakfast today, sir? I didn't actually, no. I was in a bit of a rush getting to school, so I skipped breakfast. Uh, Favourite breakfast, oh, it's probably uh, fried eggs. Fried eggs on toast, maybe? Perfect. I just happen to have an egg here. Okay, I'm going to take <gasps> my gloves off for day. a moment. So we have a just one left just and the, uh, the, the use by date is today so it's still, <laughs> excellent, it's, excellent. It's still safe to eat. Um, so fried egg. Fried egg. Okay, so fried egg. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place it into not quite a frying pan but we've got a container here. Okay um, I hope I don't crack your yolk. <laughs> so I'm going to place the egg. Look at that. Looks beautiful sir. And um, instead of the conventional 
way of cooking the egg. I'm going to go for the uh, the cooling of Would the you egg. Like? Okay. Um, why not, please? Thank you very I'll much. I'll do the honours. Now, what's going to happen is that the egg is going to cool down significantly. And as it cools, we will see a change taking place. I'm just going to put a little bit extra on top to... Extra. Huh? Extra. <laughs> see what you did, sir? Thank you. Um, and in a moment, we'll be able to see the delicious oh, looking... It's coming on nicely. ...egg. Um, I presume you like a hard yolk, sir? Do I have head? a choice? Not, not really, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... We started with our clear egg white, and I'm just going to tip away some of the, um, and there you go, one absolutely gorgeous fried egg. Oh, that but looks... there's a difference, sir. Oh, really? Um, I'm actually not going to let you eat it. Oh. Okay, so there's a nice solid yolk in the middle, and the white looks like it's fried beautifully, doesn't it? It looks beautiful. <laughs> Little bit of a difference though. Eat. Little bit of a difference. Um, all we've done is we've frozen it. So it's not actually, a chemical reaction has not actually taken place like you would have when you fry an egg normally. Um, so if we leave this, we should be able to get the white back to being how it was because this is a freezing process. It's a physical change, not a chemical reaction unlike frying the egg. I see. So if we leave that for a while, um, and shall we carry on with our next experiment? Indeed, indeed. Well, as lovely as Friday is for um, my breakfast, I'm trying to be on a bit of a bit of a diet at the moment. So, how about some fruit and veg? Fruit, fruit and veg. veg. Take your pick. Oh. What would you like? Uh, so, what do we have? We have a choice of uh, clementines, tangerines. Who knows? We've got bananas, and we've got some lovely cherry tomatoes. I think I'm going to start with a banana. I'm going to see your banana, and I've got a lovely little handle here to pop my. <laughs> Tangerine in. And do you know what? For good measure, I'm going to put a few tomatoes in to go with my citrus. Do you know, I'll have one as well. Now, plants are made of cells, just like animals, just like you are made of cells. And these cells contain an awful lot of water. And water that's taken down to minus 196 degrees is going to freeze. So each of the cells within our and in our plants here are going to become well, very, very hard, very, very solid, and very, very brittle. So what we can do is once we've given them a minute or so to freeze, we can test out their properties and see how frozen they actually are. So I've gone for a tomato first. Do you know, I eat very well this lunchtime, so I, I don't feel the need to eat it. And as much as I like ice cream and frozen things, I got a better idea. <laughs> What do we think? Right, so it's super, super frozen. So normally when you squash a tomato, it goes everywhere, juice flies around. I'm gonna give this a little tap and see what happens. Just basting over here, don't mind me. Oh, why would that happen? Un under, undercooked, under frozen, I guess I should say. I think it may well be under frozen, but I think I've got some in here that you can see already have frozen. Ah. And this one here, if I hold it up, you should be able to see the expansion of the water in the cells because the tomato's actually already broken apart. Should I, should I give it another go? With a, yeah, give with it another tap? go. I'm going to try my one as well in a minute. Ooh, my satsuma's looking lovely. <laughs> Ooh, hey, limey. there we go. Oh, I think my cherry tomatoes suffered a similar fate to yours. Well, here we go. We've got half a cherry tomato, at least. <laughs> uh, let's try and get it flat side down. Oh, easier said than done. No, we're going this way up. All right. Are we ready? Yeah, I'm going to stand back, though. Whee! Hey, well, that's a nice mess to clean up later. <laughs> yeah, mind up the cameraman. <laughs> so I'm going to pull out... Ooh. I'm going to pull up my lovely, my lovely satsuma. I'm not great at DIY, to be honest, so I'm not, I'm not really great with a hammer, but let, let's give it a go, see what happens. 
Yep, I think we can safely what say. What a lovely that was mess you've made there. Now, what have we got last? My banana? Okay, here we go. So, banana is now super duper solid. In fact, I reckon it's so solid um, that I'm able to hit a nail. Here I have a nail into a piece of wood. Now, to help me hold my nail, we're going to move this for a second. Let's give it a go. Very nice. How about another one, sir? Another one, another one. I can try another one. Prove it's not a, not a trick. Ooh. A banana as a hammer. What do we need it? these for? Shall we go back to your egg? Yes, let's Shall do that. Go back to your egg. So we'll have a little, a little look. Now it's already. It was looking delicious. Uh oh. Well, you you said to me earlier. That, oh, it's a bit slimy. You said to me earlier that you, you maybe yeah. would like a runny yolk. So it looked like a normal cooked fried egg, but now it's got a bit warmer. Um, it's white and, and the yolk as well have now turned back into a liquid. It looks like your yolk is going to leak. It does. Um, <laughs> it hasn't all quite um, melted yet, So, um, but you can already start to see the change. Now, I obviously, as head of science, really do appreciate all of my staff oh, of okay course, and i would course. like to just say thank you ever so much for all of your hard work for me you do for our students oh my gosh you're so generous uh, well i'd like to thank my parents um, i'd like to thank all the students of hayesfield it, it all comes down to the fantastic people around me um this is what we're putting them in the nitrogen aren't we yeah okay let's do that then some for you some for me let's give it a go Now again, plants are obviously, flowers are plants. They are made of plant cells. They are filled with water and they're probably gonna behave in a similar way to our other fruit and veg that we've looked at earlier. Just going to move a little space so that we can, I guess we're gonna hammer them, aren't we, sir? Well, we can give it a go. Do we need to hammer them? I don't think so. Any other ideas? So they have maintained their beauty, but I can hear them Ooh. crackling away. Ready? Yeah. Confetti, sir. For you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, now, one thing that we did see, actually, then, one thing we did see is when we put our flowers in, we saw a whole load of uh, what looked like a gas coming out. Now, that's not actually the nitrogen. What we're actually seeing there is water vapour. Now, you might ask where the water's actually come from, but obviously plants have a lot of water in them. We also have a lot of water in our breath. So if we blow... <laughs> <laughs> if we blow carefully, obviously, onto... Our liquid nitrogen we see we get clouds and these are quite literally clouds that's all clouds are made of is water vapor that's that's quite cold and it ends up in these nice white billowy clouds it's quite impressive isn't it it's okay I, I think I can do better no surely not I'm the head of physics uh, I don't want to pull rank <laughs> Okay, can I help you out with this? So, what we're going to do is a cloud in a bucket. I love clouds and as a child would like to have got inside some clouds until my parents pointed out I'd have fallen to the ground. I see. That's a bit of physics for you. So, what we're going to do... I have a do, bucket. We've got a bucket. We've got a bucket. I also... Oh. I also have a bucket. Into our larger bucket, we're going to place some boiling hot water. In our smaller bucket, we're going to place some liquid nitrogen. Okay, we're then going to pop our bucket of hot water there and I'm going to chuck the liquid nitrogen in it. All right, we'll see how that goes. Let's get filling. I'm just going to boil the kettle. Gosh, we have made a mess. Yeah, but it's fun though, isn't it? It certainly is. So we're just waiting for the kettle, the pre-boiled kettle to boil. I'm gonna put 
the um, hot water into the bucket and then I'm very quickly going to dump the liquid nitrogen into the bucket as fast as I can and we should get just just a small a small cloud. All right I think I am just about there with our nitrogen and I think I'm just about there with my kettle. One thing we do have to be careful when we're doing this is that we do not, we do not want to get too close to this. So I will are stand we ready? Well back. Okay, three, two, one. And that's what you call a cloud in a bucket. I think you win. I think you win. I think that's that's the best thing we're going to see today. So thank you very much, Miss Whatley. That was absolutely brilliant. And thank you for all your help. Indeed, indeed. Good night. Thank you for watching. Hello folks, here we've got another experiment that you can do at home. This one involves having a look at whether different animals prefer to be in the light or prefer to be in the dark. And the animal that we're going to work with today is the woodlouse. So I've got a box here. In my box I've got some damp leaves and buried under the damp leaves are a number of woodlice that we've picked up from the school grounds. 
So just before you can start this experiment, you're going to have to go and find some wood lice for yourself. You can find them um, in your garden or just outside. They'll be underneath stones, underneath bits of bark. So have a look and see whether you can get a few. Please be careful with them, okay? And make sure you, know, you can take a note of where you collect them from because you're going to put them back at the end of the experiment. I'm going to have a look at whether those wood lice prefer to live in the light or the dark. So what I've got here is a Lego tray. And I put a little border around my Lego tray, slightly bigger than the height of a woodlouse, and I've covered half of it with a piece of dark paper. So I've effectively got a very dark side of the tray and a very light side of my tray. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a woodlouse, I'm going to put that woodlouse in the tray, and I'm going to start a stopwatch. And I'm going to record the amount of time that the woodlouse spends in the dark and in the light. Then I'm going to pop that woodlouse away and I'm going to try it with a second one. And I'm going to see if there's a pattern. Do we think woodlice like to prefer to spend time in the dark or do they prefer to spend it in the light? Remember, be gentle with your woodlice and put them back where you got them at the end of the experiment. Hello, I'm Mr Keach and this is the Van de Graaff generator, which produces very high volts. Um, I'm going to just show you a few little tricks. Um, if you're interested in this sort of thing and you think this is quite fascinating, I do will be running a um, enrichment week activity called Arcs and Sparks. So if you like this sort of thing, then please sign up. So what basically we've got here is a way of generating lots and lots of charge. In fact, we get about 300,000 volts uh, on this um, on this dome. What we got is a rubber band and that creates the charge as it goes around without going into too much detail. So if we now go switch the thing on, you might hear it crackling a little. Now I'm not getting a shot because this, you can see the wire coming off this. There's a, it, which is to take into ground. So it goes to the easiest route. So even though it's such a high voltage, but I'm not sure my phone's very happy in my pocket. Obviously, the further away you go, the longer it takes for the charge to build up to bridge the gap. But if we do it like that, we get sparks very quickly. If we bring them back out, we get bigger sparks, but they're not so frequent. There we are. Right, OK. I'm just going to turn this off, discharge it, so everything's safe. Right. Now, one thing we know about charge is that if they're charges are all the same, they repel each other. So what I'm going to do is this. Just, these are just ordinary pie cases. You have your mince pies in or something like that, apple pies. And if I switch this on now, let's see what happens. They beautifully all the charge go out together and because they're light they're enough to push them over the, away from each other and away from the Van de Graaff. Right, I've made a mess here. But I am going to call on my glamorous assistant now, because I think it's about time we put a, attached a person to, to this. So we've got the lovely Miss Jarvis here, who's volunteered to have 300,000 volts put through her. You're not pregnant. You don't have a heart condition? No and you don't have a pacemaker or hearing implants. In that case, as you're healthy, you should be fine. What you mustn't do is take your hands off this until I tell you to do so. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to place your hands on there, and we're gonna charge Miss Jarvis up with lots of one charge, and we'll see what happens. If you give your hair the shampoo shake, oh yes, look at that. 
the charges are the same, or she's all charged one way, and the light things, like her hair, it's being repelled, and it's trying to get as far away from each other as you can. You can see that's a that's a lovely lovely look, Miss Jarvis. I think uh, think you should go out on a night out like that. I think. Okay, now we do need to discharge her safely. So what I'm going to do is just turn this off. Now, if you take your hands off, and if you touch the bench, not the metal bits. Right, and you see now we've all the charges have gone away from her through the table, through the ground, and she's nicely grounded. Thank you very much, Miss Jarvis. I'm going to just show one last thing to, again, showing how charges. A lot of things have charges, and they can be positive or negative, and we don't really know they can be either or. So I'm going to just blow some bubbles at our Van de Graaff. That's if I can blow bubbles. I can see how they rapidly go towards the Van de Graaff. I wish I was better at blowing bubbles. A few moments later. Ah, there we had one. Did you see that? It flew the other way. Because it had the same charge as the Van de Graaff. Right, okay, so that's our little demonstration do. Now, obviously, this will stay charged, so what's really important is that I don't wander off now and leave it. I need to discharge it. See that. So now the Van de Graaff's safe. And there you have a few little things that the Van de Graaff generator does. Thank you.
This one is looking at the effects of different colours of light on the growth of plants. There's lots of experimental work that's been done by scientists having a look at whether or not plants grow best under white light or under different colours of light, like red, or blue or green. So, in this experiment, it's really simple. What you need are some cress seeds, okay? Here I've got some cress seeds sat on some cotton wool in a petri dish with some water. If you haven't got a petri dish at home, which you probably don't, just using, use a plate or use um, a tray or a little bit of a Tupperware plastic box, something like that, okay? So I've got my cress seeds in my um, tray. Now I need a way of making sure that only one colour of light shines on them. And so what I've got are two different coloured pieces of plastic. You can pick these up from craft shops, provided that the COVID restrictions allows you to do so. You can get them online. Or you might decide that you want to use tissue paper or something like that. As long as it allows different colours of light through, that's great. So I've got an orange piece and a blue piece. Now, the best way of doing this is if you have some way of blocking out all the other colours of light. So I'm going to use this cardboard box. And as you can see, I've cut a hole in the cardboard box, which is just small enough to be covered by my piece of coloured plastic. So, all I'm going to do is I'm going to put my um, Petri dish with the seeds on it somewhere warm and um, light, so ideally maybe on a windowsill near a radiator. I'm going to cover them with my box, and I'm going to put my piece of coloured um, plastic on the top of the box. And then I'm going to leave that for a few days and see what happens, see whether the cress seeds grow and how tall they grow. Now I will have to go back every day or so and just water them, um, but that shouldn't take too long at all. Ideally, if you can, it'd be really interesting to investigate the effects of more than one colour of light. So you might set up one experiment with one colour filter and set up another experiment somewhere else with another coloured filter and see whether there's any difference in the growth of the cress.
folks, today we're going to have a look at another practical that you can do at home. This time we're going to have a look at the effect of caffeine on the growth of plants. Now there's lots of interesting scientific work that's been done having a look at the effects of different chemicals on the growth of plants and whether they help to promote plant growth and make them grow taller or whether they inhibit plant growth, whether they make them smaller. So to, in this practical you're going to need some cress seeds, some dishes with some cotton wool in and a source of caffeine. Now the source of caffeine that I'm going to use is some tea. Um, and as a control, just to check that there's not something else in the tea that's going to be affecting the growth of plants, I've also got some decaffeinated tea as well. So tea with caffeine and tea without caffeine. And I'm going to test both on the growth of plants. Now, if you don't want to use tea, you can use any other source of caffeine. So coffee and decaf coffee are good um, sources, as, are co as is Coca-Cola or Pepsi or something else like that. So the way you set this one up is really easy. You take your two little dishes with some cotton wool in. I'm using Petri dishes, but you probably don't have these at home. So you can just use a saucer or a small bowl or a piece of Tupperware or anything like that, okay? Onto your cotton wool, you need to put space out about 10 seeds and try and make sure that they're, about, they're evenly spread out so there's no competition between them for space. And then we're going to, once you've done that, we're going to add our tea. Now, you need to make sure, if you want your investigation to be valid, you want it to be a fair test, that you're going to be putting the same volume of tea into each cup. In science, we'd often use a pipette to check that we're putting the same volume in. Again, you probably don't have these at home, so you can just use something else to measure, a spoon, for example. And if you use the same spoon each time, you're gonna get the same volume of liquid. So, for my ones, I'm gonna put in about two tablespoons of tea. First, the, de the caffeinated tea, and then into the next pot, the decaf tea. I'm then going to find somewhere warm and somewhere light, so ideally a windowsill next to a radiator, and I'm going to leave those crest seeds to grow for a few days. Now, it's really important that you don't allow your crest seeds to dry out, so you can just constantly go back and regularly top them back up um, with the tea. Make sure you use the right one, and make sure you give each the same volume. And then after a few days, they should germinate, and you should be able to measure the height and you should be able to then see, well, does caffeine help plants to grow or does it not? Have you ever considered the world beneath your feet? There's a whole science to do with the rocks and minerals that are down there. And we call this science geology. But what is a rock? Take these two examples. Here, I've got one of the more famous types of rock. We use this for worktops and we see it around quite a lot. This is granite. It contains lots of crystals of different minerals. Whereas here, I have a second type. This is a type we see a lot of around Bath. This is limestone. Now this is an igneous rock. This is a sedimentary rock. But that just comes down to the way that they are formed. Both are made up of minerals. But what is a mineral? So minerals are all around us. They make up all of the rocks beneath our feet. Minerals themselves though are simply chemicals. They are ionic compounds. And that means they contain particles of both metals and non-metals called ions. Now these ions then held together by strong electrostatic force of attraction in regular arrangements. But this arrangement will differ between different minerals. So they all appear different. Some might appear as grains, others as crystals. For example, the crystals that I've got of galena in this rock here. Galena is lead sulfate, and this rock, you can feel it, is really heavy. And you can see the crystals on the top of it. Let's have a look at another couple of crystals in a bit more detail. Okay, so let's have a look at these crystals here. Now, these are crystals of the mineral halite. Halite is also known as sodium chloride, 
which is your basic table salt that you will have at home. Now, I want to have a little look at the shape of the crystals that we've got here, okay? As you can see, they are a cubic structure. They're actually almost perfect cubes. And it's perfectly possible for you to grow crystals like this at home. All you've got to do is take yourself a mug or a cup of boiling water and dissolve as much salt in it as possible. The way to do that is to keep stirring it and keep adding salt until a little bit is left on the bottom. Once you've done that, I suggest you put a pebble or a stone or some rough material inside the cup and then leave it somewhere cool. It's best if you leave it somewhere cool because that way it will evaporate slower and you'll end up with bigger crystals. But not all crystals are cubic like this. There are lots of different shapes. Let's have a look at another. Now this mineral is very different. This is the mineral chalcanthite. You will have seen this in school as the chemical copper sulfate. Okay, now the copper sulfate contains copper, sulfur and oxygen, but these are what we call pent aqua crystals, which means they also contain five water molecules. Now, if you look very carefully at the shape, you will see that we make four sided shapes here. But the beauty of this is it's actually four sides of different length. Now we call this shape structure orthorhombic, as it makes a rhomboid shape in two dimensions. And as you can see, it's very different from the halide crystals we looked at earlier. Okay, let's have a look at this last mineral. Now, at first glance, this may look like a gold nugget made up of the rare metal gold, which would be very expensive indeed, but it's not. This mineral is called fool's gold, or to give it its technical name, pyrite. Pyrite is actually made of iron and sulphur. It's iron disulfide. And it's really obvious to see why we would call it fool's gold. Okay, we can't see the individual crystals. They are too small. But this is quite an interesting mineral that you can find in rocks around the world. Do beware though, unlike a real gold nugget, this is completely worthless. Okay, it's got almost no value whatsoever. So there we go. Minerals, crystals, one and the same thing. And there's so many different types out there. Now, if you want to do something at home, why not join in my science fair competition about growing your own crystals? At the end of this section, I'm gonna put up a website. On that website, there's lots of different ways for you to grow your own crystals. And I'd really love to see you growing your own crystals and sending us some photographs from home. In the meantime, here is a little crystal garden that I prepared for you earlier.
tricks, here's another experiment that you can do at home. For this experiment, you're going to need some wood lice. Um, you can find wood lice outside in the garden or on the street. They tend to be found under leaves, under stones um, and under bits of wood. Please be careful with any wood lice that you collect and make a note of where you get them from because you're going to put them back at the end of the experiment. Now in this experiment, you're going to have a look at whether wood lice prefer certain conditions or not. So, what, we what I've made here is what's called a T-shaped maze. And a T-shaped maze is a maze in the shape of a T. So we've got a starting point here at the bottom base of the letter T, and then when the wood lice walks to the end, it's got a choice. It can either turn left or it can turn right. And what you're going to do is you're going to put a single wood louse at the beginning of the maze, and you're going to let it crawl. And into the end of each of the T's, you're going to put one condition or another. So you might decide to put a sweet treat at the end of one of the mazes, maybe a bit of honey or a bit of sugary water, something you think might attract the woodlouse. And you're going to see, does the woodlouse wood louse turn towards the treat or does it turn away from it? Once you finish with that woodlouse, you can take it out and try with another woodlouse. Keep going until you think you can see a pattern. And remember, please be gentle with your woodlice and put them back where you found them at the end of the investigation. Now, what I want to do is talk to you today about oxygen. Oxygen is the eighth element in the periodic table and it's one of the most important ones. It's uh, essential for life and we use it in a process called respiration. Respiration is the process by which all living things or organisms get their energy. So without oxygen, we wouldn't have any energy to survive. Uh, it's also one of the main components of water. Uh, again, all living things need water to survive. So without oxygen, there would be no water and therefore no living things. Um, it's also allowed us to explore the most wonderful places. The moon. The moon's got no oxygen on it. Uh, because of oxygen, we can go to the moon, we can see what's there. Um, it's allowed us to see really, really deep in the ocean, right down at the bottom. There's no oxygen there. You can see all those weird volcanic vents with those funny little tube bones in there. All sorts of places we wouldn't have been able to go to if there was no oxygen. But there's one reason I really love oxygen. And it's one of the reasons that I became a chemistry teacher. Uh, it allows me to just set fire to things.